Welcome to tonight's Expert Angle webinar titled Androgen Deprivation for Prostate Cancer, More Than Meets the Eye. My name is Rosemary Koo, Support Services Assistant here at Prostate Cancer Canada, and I will be moderating tonight's webinar. To begin, we'll start with a few housekeeping items. If we can kindly advance to the next slide. At the end of this presentation, the Expert Angle team will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. Secondly, all attendees are currently muted to allow for the best audio possible. Third, this presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the Prostate Cancer Canada website. Lastly, if you are having any technical issues, please email our team at expertangle at prostatecancer.ca. If we can go on to the next slide. I'd also like to mention that we here at PCC have developed a range of patient education resources such as booklets and brochures. If you are interested in downloading or ordering our resources, please visit our website at prostatecancer.ca. I would now like to introduce you to our guest speaker, Dr. Laurent Azoulay. Dr. Azoulay is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health at the Gerald Bronfman Department of Oncology at McGill University and a senior investigator at the Center for Clinical Epidemiology of the Lady Davis Institute of the Jewish General Hospital. His CIHR funded research program focuses on the association between certain medications and the risk of cancer, as well as assessing the safety of cancer treatments. He has published numerous studies assessing the effects of androgen deprivation th therapy several of which were published in top tier journals. Without further ado, I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Azoulay. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present uh, some of the work that was conducted in my group over the years. Um, so before starting the presentation, I would like to mention that I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, so today, uh, I'll be presenting studies on, on a topic that has been close to my heart uh, in part because I have a loved one that has prostate cancer and is being treated with androgen deprivation therapy. In fact, many of the studies that I've conducted in the past have been inspired by um, what I've been observing from that loved, uh, loved person. So, um, so it's, it's very nice to kind of see this connection between um, someone with prostate cancer and be able to do research and, and investigate some of, these, um, some of these unattended effects of androgen deprivation therapy. So as uh, most of you know already, prostate cancer is the most frequently uh, diagnosed cancer uh, among men in developed countries. And there are different ways of, um, of treating patients with prostate cancer. Uh, the first can be without any intervention, also known as watchful waiting, or they can receive an active treatment. And this treatment can include surgeries such as radical prostatectomy, radiation therapy, and or androgen deprivation therapy and I'll be uh, saying ADT for short for the rest of the presentation. Now, ADT can be achieved through different means. Uh, it could be surgical, such as bilateral orchiectomy. This is essentially castration, uh, which was the common way of how this was done in the past, obviously much less popular today, um, where it was replaced with chemical castration, and this can be, do, can be done with drugs, such as gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GnRH agonists, and oral antiandrogens. So these treatments work well, uh, in, certainly in patients for whom uh, the, there's a clear survival benefit. Unfortunately, ADT is not an innocuous treatment. Um, by suppressing testosterone levels, there are certain unattended effects that could occur. And this has been dubbed the androgen deprivation syndrome. This includes dyspilidemia, which is um, uh, high cholesterol levels, insulin resistance, and there's also a modification of body composition towards an increase of fat mass. And of course, these are, uh, are features that can be associated with a number of adverse events. And, and this has been a focus of my research. So I'll be presenting today uh, four studies that were conducted by my group uh, uh, over the years. Uh, we've conducted uh, a few more of these, but I've picked these four um, because I think they were influential and uh, actually very interesting. So the first we'll be looking at the association between ADT and the risk of stroke. The second, ADT and the, the risk of acute kidney injury. 
the third, which was published this year, uh, the association between ADT and venous thromboembolism. And finally, another study that was published this year, the association between uh, ADT and inflammatory bowel disease. As you can see, these are very different outcomes, um, though the common feature over here is the effect of low testosterone and how uh, low, low testosterone and how it can affect these different, um, very different outcomes. So we'll go look at the first study, which looked at ADT and stroke. So as I've mentioned, ADT is associated with metabolic changes. And these can put patients at increased risk of cerebral vascular events. And by that, we mean ischemic strokes, the blood clot in the brain, or transient ischemic attacks, which are temporary effects, small clots in the brain, which tend to be temporary. Um, when we conducted the studies, there were very few studies that had looked at this uh, potential adverse event. And I should uh, mention that this study was funded by Prostate Cancer Canada. So the objective of our study was to determine whether different types of androgen deprivation therapy are associated with an increased risk of stroke or transient ischemic attacks in patients newly diagnosed with prostate cancer. And this is a study that was published in European Urology in 2011. So I'll go straight to, uh, to the results. And this was a case control study. And um, as can be seen over here, compared to no use of androgen deprivation therapy, different types of uh, modalities, different types of ADTs were associated with an increased risk. So for example, the GnRH agonist only when they're used in monotherapy was associated with an 18% increased risk. The risk did increase if it was used um, with, if ADT was composed of oral antiandrogens. Um, there is also the combined androgen blockade, which is a combination of GnRH agonists and oral antiandrogens with a 26% increased risk. And here we can see that the highest risk was among those patients who had bilateral orchiectomy or the surgical castration had the highest risk. Um, so this study confirmed um, what has been reported previously, that ADT and different forms of ADT may increase the risk of stroke or TIAs, but can do so to different degrees depending on what the, the specific modality um, is. We also looked at the effect of duration of use um, among those who use generative agonists. So now, we focused on the generative agonists because these are the most popular treatments uh, for, uh, for ADT. And um, as we can see here on the, on the left side, we have these are the durations in months. And um, so there's no increased risk in the first four months. But the risk starts to increase from 5 to 12 months, 13 to 24 months. And then it returns close to null, to null after a year. So we have this kind of bell-shaped curve with risk. Um, and this may explain this lack of an, an association after more than 25 months is something that we call depletion of susceptibles. In other words, those who are at risk tend to have the event earlier on. And those who get past this point, if you want to survive the adverse event, potential risk of the drug, do not experience it. Um, so this actually is interesting because it provides us a time window where we can be extremely vigilant and follow patients um, and actually look for signs of stroke or transient ischemic attacks. Um, so timing is also very important over here. So a summary of this first study um, is that different types of ADTs may increase the risk of stroke, uh, TIAs, in patients with prostate cancer. And as we have seen, uh, the, we observed an increased risk with all ADTs. However, the highest risk was in patients who underwent bilateral orchiectomy surgical castration. And of course, this is not a very commonly used treatment today. Um, but in our study, a uh, study actually went back to the 80s. So we had some patients that were um, still exposed to this type of therapy. We observed uh, no increased risk on those on com combined androgen blockade. But again, the point estimate was elevated. Um, and this may be due to a lack of statistical power because we didn't have too many patients on this therapy. So possibly if we had a larger study, this would have been statistically significant. And as I've mentioned, we, uh, for GenRH agonists, we saw that there was an, a risk that was observed early in the treatment, but then declined after longer periods of use, let's say more than 25 months of use. And again, this is a, a term that we use in epidemiology called depletion of susceptibles, which means that if it's going to happen, it's going to happen more earlier than later. 
So now I'm going to jump to our second study. And um, our second study was actually an interesting, um, it's an interesting story because um, one of our postdocs was interested in acute kidney injury and um, you know, and basically he, he had this hypothesis that low testosterone levels may affect kidney function and has done some work on the topic and raised the hypothesis that um, based on animal models that uh, testosterone may promote, so low testosterone le levels, a reduction of testosterone levels to castric levels, which for example what ADT does, can promote renal dysfunction and injury. And this is a very complicated area uh, in the literature. Um, whenever you speak about hormones, there things tend to be there are different studies that point to different directions. Some say it's testosterone may be protective for a particular site or organ, and others saying that it's not. So we have to bear that in mind. But there, are, there were some animal studies that suggested that reducing testosterone levels to, to the nail um, promoted renal dysfunction and injury. And in contrast, there were other studies that showed that a repletion of testosterone in castrated animals offered a protective effect to the kidneys. So this raised the hypothesis that ADT, which lowers testosterone levels to castration levels, may have an effect, may antagonize some of the beneficial effects um, on renal vessels. So, uh, and, and if in doing so, it may possibly um, affect, uh, increase the risk of injury, such as acute kidney injury. And so the objective was to um, to assess whether the use of androgen deprivation therapy is associated with an increased risk of acute kidney injury in patients with prostate cancer. And at the time, um, this was the first study on the topic. Now, this is a study that was published in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, 2013, by uh, one of my postdocs from Italy, Francesco Lappi. And essentially what this table shows is that um, the use of androgen deprivation therapy was associated with a very high risk of um, acute kidney injury um, with here a, um, an odds ratio of 2.48 or if you want a 100, close to 150 percent increased risk. Uh, these were people who are currently using it when they had the event, but those who stopped using it did not have an, a, an increased risk. So this was really limited to those who had used it, were currently using it, and those who did not, who stopped using it, the, the risk went back down, which is reassuring. Um, then we also looked at different types of treatments, so the, as we've done with the previous study, looking at um, different uh, ADT modalities, and those on combined androgen blockade had the highest increased risk, so these are patients using generic agonists with oral antiandrogens. Um, we also had estrogens, which again, um, this is actually an old treatment, but we had it in our cohort because we did go back to the 80s where it was... Um, uh, it was still being used. Now it has fallen out of favor. And then we have uh, the, different, um, the different modalities. Perhaps the one that is the most uh, interesting to us are the generic agonists, which is the main way people are being treated with, with ADD today, where the risk was nearly twofold. So that brings us now to our third study. And um, Again, as I've mentioned, um, ADT, by lowering uh, testosterone levels, it does funny things. And one of them is that it can lead to a hypercoagulable state. Uh, and if in doing so, it may increase the risk of venous thromboembolism. These are blood clots either in the, in the veins of, of the leg or create a, a blood clot in the, in the lungs, which can be potentially dangerous. So, um, when we had we had looked at this, and there were some. Um, I'm skipping here the complicated um, biological mechanisms, but there was a rationale for looking at this. In fact, there were uh, previous studies that have looked at this already. Um, and it's important to mention, of course, that VTE in patients with cancer can have deleterious consequences. It affects the way we treat them. It can affect subsequent treatment. So this is something that we needed to investigate and quantify. And um, as I've mentioned, there were, again, a few studies that have assessed that whether ADT may increase the risk of VTE in patients with prostate cancer. And of the studies that were conducted, 
many had certain methodological problems, so that's why we felt that we need another study on the topic. And so here again, the objective was to determine whether ADT is associated with an increased risk of ET in patients with prostate cancer. And this is a study that was published uh, this year um, in European Urology. And again, here this was done, this was conducted by one of my postdocs. Um, so what we found was that patients who are currently using ADT were at increased risk of VTE. Uh, and here the, the risk was 1.84, so you're looking at an 84% increased risk. And this was highly significant. However, for those who have stopped using it, the risk was close to the null, no association. So again, this is reassuring. So it's among those who are using the drug that we have to be more vigilant. Now this is a, I uh, apologize if it's a busy table, but um, we've done some analysis by duration of use as we have done in the previous studies. And what we see over here is that uh, in the first six months of use, uh, there is no clear association when we're looking at any type of ADT. And then the risk gradually increases, but then plateaus, it stays high, unlike what we've seen with the stroke study when it went down to the null. So when patients are on this treatment, they remain in a hypercoagulable state. And we did the same thing for generic agonists only, and we observed a similar pattern where we observed uh, an increased risk earlier on, which kind of maintained and stayed um, tattooed uh, with longer durations of use. And finally, uh, this brings us to the uh, fourth and last study. Now, uh, what I've presented so far may seem alarming. Um, and, uh, you know, presented three studies that showed increased risk with ADT um, with different types of outcomes. But I thought that it would be a good idea to finish with a more positive note um, with one study that we conducted uh, this year, which I think is pretty neat. So the fourth study where we looked at is uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So the question is, how does that relate to prostate cancer and with androgen deprivation therapy? Well, there are, there's already a precedent for this. There are previous studies that have associated the use of hormones, uh, for example, oral contraceptives and hormone replacement therapy with an increased risk of inflammatory bowel disease. So there is this, this association between the use of hormones um, and this, this condition. And again, whenever we talk about hormones, things get very complex. Uh, but what we do know is that there is some kind of uh, relationship between sex hormones, the immune system, and changes in the mucosal barrier. And again, there's, uh, when we conducted the study, there were some studies that showed, um, I believe it was in monkeys, uh, that androgen deprivation through surgical castration can actually protect, sorry, that was not in monkeys, that was in, in the porcelain model, so in, in, in pig, um, have shown that uh, androgen deprivation is actually protective. So it increases what's called intestinal permeability and also changes um, the composition of gut microbiota. So these are, this is a very important with respect to inflammatory bowel disease because these, uh, the gut microbiota and other um, functions of the, of the colon are thought to be involved in the pathology. So if, so if ADT has an effect on these, on these, at least these two components of the disease, then perhaps, uh, it, it, be, it may be worth looking at. So when we looked at this, um, when we, we went through this literature, um, there were plenty of studies on oral contraceptives, hormone replacement therapy, but there were absolutely no study on androgen deprivation therapy, which does essentially the opposite of the other, uh, the other studies, which were you have, you're, you're actually putting, in, you know, you're using exogenous hormones here. ADT has this opposite effect of lowering your endogenous hormones. So uh, we were very curious when we, <laughs> we conducted the study. And um, again, as I mentioned, this was the first study to look at whether ADT is associated with the incidence of ABD in men with prostate cancer. And this was published uh, this year, uh, just this past June, in American Journal of Epidemiology. 
so what we found was very interesting. Um, the, first, it's important to note that um, IBD, inflammatory, inflammatory bowel disease, is it's a rare condition and it's even rarer in the elderly men. Uh, so of course, while we we would have wanted to see, uh, you know, so for some of our analysis, we didn't have the power, the statistical power to look at this in detail, to look at duration, things that we've done in previous studies. Nonetheless, what we're seeing over here is that the use of ADT was associated here with a hazard ratio of 0 0.49, or if you want, a 51% risk reduction. So ADT essentially may be associated with a protective effect on the incidence of IBD. Uh, when we look at specific types of IBD, you have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, we saw that the, the point estimates were in this in the similar direction. Again, uh, protective effect in, uh, in both of them. Although we didn't have enough uh, numbers for Crohn's disease, that's why it did not achieve statistical power, but if you look at the, the overall direction of the point estimates here, they are very consistent with a protective effect. So this was a pretty neat study um, where essentially we, we see how hormones can have different effects. Uh, in this case, it, removing the testosterone, lowering testosterone levels to castrate levels may have beneficial effects uh, in terms of preventing IBD. So um, what do we, just to recap, we found that the use of ADT was associated with a significantly decreased risk of IBD. Um, what's interesting is that we observed a large effect, so a 51% risk reduction is not negligible. Um, and we believe that, you know, this highlights a potential role for androgens in gut inflammation and autoimmunity. And because this was the first study on the topic, it would be extremely interesting to see this replicated in other settings and by other groups to see whether ADT may have a role in the prevention and treatment of IBD. So this may be a new avenue for a totally different condition. So um, for the first, the four studies I've presented, if you have, a, we take a take home message from it, um, we can see that the use of ADT is associated with a number of unintended effects. And these unintended effects can either be associated, it could be positive or negative as we've seen. Um, again, the, what we have to be careful about and I think the key is not to say, I'm not going to use ADT if it's intended for you. ADT works very well. And I know that. I have a loved one that's on the treatment, and it certainly helps that, that person. Um, so, but, but there is this, this trend of prescribing, of using ADT in patients for whom the benefits are less clear, so, such as patients with localized disease. So it's, again, it's a balance between risks and benefits. Also, as we've seen in these observational studies, um, is that we have this now this natural experiment of patients on a therapy that lowers androgen levels. And um, this, this now gives us this opportunity to investigate the different effects of androgen in the body. Uh, as we've seen, it may increase the risk of cerebrovascular effects, venous thromboembolism, um, or acute kidney injury, but it may, may also have um, we, uh, we better we understand better the roles of uh, the role of androgen on other uh, on other tissues such as the colon. So it's a way to better understand how androgens work in the body, especially in males, and and how they can interact with different biological systems. So um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the FRQS for a career award and CHR for a foundation scheme grant that allows me to do all this work. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to take questions. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Azoulay, for that wonderful presentation. It was very informative, and we here at PCC, um, we're very proud to have funded your work, so thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask all of our viewers at home to please type in their questions within the question box. I would like to remind you that we are not here to give um, clinical advice. If you could kindly forward all of those questions to your healthcare professional, that would be great. Um, before I begin with the question period, I would like to do a quick 
poll just to see how many people are participating in this webinar. So if all of our viewers could please respond to this question which asks, how many additional people are you watching this webinar with? That would be great. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. So we'll now begin with our question period. Um, the first question that we have, one individual has asked if you could please comment on your research process. Um, they'd like to know more about whether or not it was hypothesis driven or if you're simply searching for mean meaningful connections within the data set. It's a great question and it's one that we always get. How do you derive your questions? Um, so there are two ways we get um, our research ideas. We often go back to the, clin the clinical trials that uh, looked at the effect of androgen deprivation or any other pharmacotherapy. And often, along with those trials, there is a table that shows adverse events with, uh, associated with, um, with uh, whatever we're, we're investigating. And often in clinical trials, you may see an imbalance between groups, between those who got the treatment, those who did not get the treatment. And uh, often, these are not statistically significant because those trials were not um, designed to assess these rare, unattended um, effects. And this is where, um, together with, a, obviously, a, a rational biological mechanism where observational studies, such as studies that we do, um, are able to fill this gap in knowledge. And so we do conduct these studies. Then there are other um, ways we can um, come up with questions. Um, so there can be uh, case reports that have, been, uh, on the, that have been published on the topic. And um, so these are individual um, um, cases of patients who experience an adverse event with ADT, uh, such, for example, the acute kidney injury uh, study, there were some case reports that have been uh, reported and published in the literature. Of course, those case reports are not on their own, are not, in, we're not able to conclude anything about the, uh, whether there's a true association, whether it's causal or not. Um, and this is where um, these, these case reports, but there, those, these case reports are, are a good way to generate study, you know, uh, research ideas. If, of course, we admit the, the threshold of biological plausibility. Uh, and finally, the, the third way is knowing what androgens, in this case, do to your body. Um, well, how they, what do they do? What's the normal functioning of androgens? And we're just really scratching the surface. We're, we're having, we now have a better understanding. But there are some studies out there, and so androgens, uh, estrogens, they all have effects uh, on our bodies. And knowing that, we, we can derive some, some biological questions that, you know, so, so co some questions that are based on biology that allows us to investigate specific events, um, such as the IBD question. So there was a slew of studies that looked at already hormone replacement therapy um, and uh, oral contraceptives. And again, in a lot of these studies, it, it wasn't clear if we're talking about an effect of estrogen or an effect of testosterone. These hormones tend to work in the reciprocal ways. Um, and this was the idea behind our study. So these are really the three main ways we, we derive our questions. We certainly do not go back to our data and, and, and go on a fishing expedition. Um, and that certainly is not a, a good way to, to approach all the, these safety questions. Uh, so it, they have to be based on biology and what we know already. Thank you so much, Dr. Azale. Um, our next question is also related to your research. Um, the individual has asked if you could please comment on whether or not you've had some research studies where you expected to find a correlation, but unfortunately did not find one. Oh, well, that happens um, all the time. Um, we, in, in terms of ADT itself, not particularly, but it does happen. Um, and often, we have actually one study that is being considered by a journal um, where um, it's a study that looked at ADT 
and the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And this is a study that was all over the media and was picked up by everyone. Um, essentially, they found that um, ADT would increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so one of my doctoral students made this his project, and we've conducted the study, and essentially what we're seeing is absolutely no association. And the, the biology seemed to be quite strong. Um, at least there was some kind of rationale out there, but we did not observe an association. Uh, and that after conducting many analysis to assess whether we had different types of biases, it really remained uh, a null association throughout. So um, that's one example, at least with respect to ADT, where we did not observe what we thought we would observe. Perfect, so stay thank tuned. you. That, that will be published soon. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Adley. Um, our next question, uh, or um, if you can actually comment on the PATCH study in the UK. The, which study, sorry? The, the PATCH study. I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> okay, not a problem. We'll move on to our next question. Um, when an individual has asked if you can comment on whether some of the effects of testosterone could be due to estradiol. So, uh, <clears throat> great question. Um, and I think that um, in part, yes. So it really depends on the outcome that you're looking at. And as I've mentioned, uh, in different tissues, maybe the effect of estrogens may be more prominent. And there's also this whole um, relationship you know, in terms of the estrogen-testosterone ratio. Right? Um, so typically, depending again on the, the, the outcomes you're looking at, estrogens or lack of, or depending on the ratio, maybe that may have an effect. So there's no, um, the answer is yes, in certain situations you could have an effect, the estrogens may have an effect, um, but again, it's really tissue specific and it really depends on the outcome that you're looking at, where it may have a greater role. Perfect, thank you. Our next question asks, where can participants go if they're interested in following more of the work that's conducted by a research team? Um, it's, a, it's actually um, a great question. Um, so uh, if you know a certain group of uh, investigators have a particular interest in a, in a domain, you can actually go on the websites um, that are often, you know, that universities have for those researchers and they would have, they, they would have their, their publications posted there. Um, uh, sometimes you have a, a bio on, on the different uh, researchers and the groups and, and what they've published recently. So that's one way to, um, to get to know what they're doing. Um, but, you know, for, for the most part, I think it's a bit of a problem in terms of communicating our research and and certainly this is a great venue to do so. So I, I applaud the organizers for this um, to be able to to convey and, and, and transmit to this what, what we've done. But um, I think you know one way to to get a better idea of what's going on is to go to the, the to the individual websites. Um, of course, things do picked up are picked up sometimes by the media, but it's um, it's usually not enough to know exactly what's going on on a day to day basis. So find your 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 local research group that you or the research group that you 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 like and and follow them somehow. <laughs> I wish I had a better answer. Not a problem. Thank you, Dr. Azale. And our next question asks: Did any of these studies take into consideration pre-existing heart conditions such as high blood pressure or kidney diseases um, within the patients? Okay, so um, the short answer is yes. Um, it's important, you know, um, the ideal study design is a randomized control trial where patients are randomized in a completely random fashion. So this will ensure that both groups have the same, you know, the same proportion of patients in both groups would have the same history, cardiovascular history, or anything for that matter, just by, by chance. Um, However, it's not always possible to do these randomized control trials, and also from an ethical standpoint, nobody would allow you to do a trial to look at um, severe adverse events. You know, nobody would sign up for a trial. Let's look if it increases their, your risk of stroke. Um, so that leaves us with the studies that we do, uh, which are observational studies, 
that um, that allow us to look at these effects, to actually look how drugs were used by real patients from the real world, and to see um, what kind of effects they have, uh, long short term and long term. Now that introduces a lot of challenges for us, because pre-existing cardiovascular history or pre-existing uh, issues, comorbidities, can can actually create a false association. So we do have tools in our toolbox, uh, you know, such as you know uh, statistical tools and also a design at the design stage that allows us to to minimize these biases. It doesn't completely remove them, and that's why observational studies are not are not going to give you a real causal relationship. But if it's replicated enough times and if it's done well enough times by different groups, then it's safe to say that perhaps there is an association. Uh, but we have those tools. They're out there, and some have been shown to work very well. Uh, but it will never be what you would have in a randomized control trial. But again, like as I mentioned, sometimes it's not even ethical to conduct randomized control trials to look at severe adverse events. Um, imagine if the outcome was mortality, then that would not work very well. So um, what we have is, is these observational studies where we use sophisticated tools to minimize bias. Perfect, thank you. And our next question asks, do your findings hold true for both continuous and intermittent ADT? Oh, great question. Uh, that's something that I've been interested in, uh, in, do, in, in, looking, in looking at because there are some differences in terms of diverse events, at least from the trials, uh, where some of the, the, the data out there is kind of contradictory. Um, unfortunately, it's not at least in our data set, in our population that we've been using, um, intermittent use is not something that's highly prevalent. So we don't have enough patients that use it intermittently. We do have those who use it, you know, more chronic. Uh, perhaps this will change in the near future or in the next few years. So we'll have to see how this plays out on these different adverse events. So stay tuned. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And our next question asks, if you can comment on how many physicians are familiar with the findings of your study and other similar studies related to the effects of ADT. Okay, um, I think that um, urologists are well aware of the cardiovascular risks of ADT. Um, and this is something that um, has been uh, out there for a little while, so I think this is something I'm that I'm pretty sure is discussed and certainly presented at different meetings. Um, so I'm, at least at, at the level of urologists, I, I believe that they're well informed. There are some of our other studies which are, for example, the IBD study, probably a little less. Um, but that's not something that would affect their practice per se, because now we're looking at a protective effect. So that would be more interesting for the gastroenterologist. Um, but in terms of uh, cerebrovascular effects, cardiovascular effects, I believe that they're, at least, you know, in a very anecdotal way, all the urologists that I know know about it. So it's, uh, I'm pretty sure that this probably applies for the rest of them. Perfect, thank you. So that concludes our question period, actually. Great. Um, so at this time, I'd like to thank all of our participants for their questions and comments. And also like to thank you, Dr. Adelaide, for providing us with all of this information. Um, we're very happy that you're one of our guest speakers for this Expert Angle series. Um, at this time, I'd also like to acknowledge the support of our sponsors, Abby, Estellis, and Jensen, who make this webinar series possible. Our next Expert Angle webinar is scheduled for September 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Our special guest for that webinar is Leah Jamnicki, whose presentation will focus on radical prostatectomies. Um, as always, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in the coming days. If you're looking for further information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO, or you can send an email to support at prostatecancer.ca. I'd also like to mention that if we did not address any of your clinical questions, to please forward those questions to your healthcare professional. Um, they would be best positioned to answer those questions. Um, with that said, that concludes this Expert Angle webinar. Thank you again to everyone who has joined us, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you so much, Dr. Adelaide. With pleasure. Thank you so much.
have a good night.